Praise God. God is good all the time. This morning, I, I told you last week that I'd like to address the subject of be prepared. Be prepared. Two weeks ago, I believe it was, September 6th, whenever that was, I had shared about the five stages of empires. And I know that I've had so many comments from you that that was just kind of like, wow, um, eye-opening, uh, challenging, but also we ended on a very high, encouraging note. Amen? That we, no matter what the situation is, we are always filled with hope. We are people of hope. Amen? Amen? And those five stages was the, the age of pioneers, the age of conquest, the age of commerce, the age of intellect, and then the age of decadence. In other words, the age of death. And, and we talked about that. And, and, and truly, I'm not going to be on this subject uh, much more beyond today um, unless something else really, really changes. But we do live in dark and dismal times. We do. Um, Hate to keep saying it and reminding us all of it, but man, we got a p- pandemic going on, and it's around the world. It's affecting you know the whole world, countries. We got politics. We have an election that's coming on, and not that I've been alive that terribly long, but I, in my lifetime, I know back in the Civil War times with Abraham Lincoln and you know the, the politics back then were pretty nasty. Um, I, this is nasty. You can't believe anybody. When you see a political ad coming on and they're moving their mouth, they're lying. I mean, it, it, it is just absolutely unbelievable. And then you think about the billions and billions of dollars they spend on ads and the money that's being spent. Um, man, it's just crazy. Um, and then we have the whole prosperity thing. Notice these are all P's. Pandemic, politics, prosperity. The whole economy our economy is a concern and worry. Oh, wait, it's a sin to worry. Don't worry about it. I believe God will send ravens to feed you if he has to. Those that love him, serve him. I mean, friends, we are people of hope. But economies around the world, other countries, I mean, there, there's, there is no magic wand that any politician has to fix these problems. Then there's the peril Man, if you're out west, you're burning up. I tell you what, what's going on over there right now is a reminder that you don't want to go to hell. Have smoke in your eyes constantly. Hurricanes. They've ran out of, this is only the second time that they've ran out of names for hurricanes. I mean, there's just turmoil ever. Then the police, I use the word police, I don't really mean police only, but I had to keep it the P words. This whole idea of, of you know, racial disparages and in, in, in the, in the things that's going on, the rioting. And the, man, if you weren't a Christian, you'd be depressed. You'd want to go out and riot. Just go out and wreck stuff. Watch insurance commercials today. They all, insurance is all about planning for the potential calamity in your life, right? That's what you have insurance for. So you see a lot of these insurance companies, that I've been noticing them extra, extra uh, because I'm talking about being prepared. And insurance is all about being prepared, you know? And what's gonna be happening? You gotta be prepared. Uh, we cover that, you know? Um, how many of you remember Y2K? Man, the fear that was put in people People were stocking up foods, guns, bullets, getting away from neighbors and friends and hightailing it out of here, digging a hole in the ground and call that living. Today, we're not much farther away from that, in my opinion, as I look around. I mean, people ask questions often, is is this the end? Is, Is the end near? That's what Christians are kind of wondering. It's like, God, is this the time? And I don't know, it could be. Could be any time. Could be while we're right here this morning. He could interrupt himself in the service and take us right now. I mean, it could happen. It's I don't spend a lot of time in it like these YouTube prophets. 
These you two prophets are talking about, okay, this happened and this can happen and, and this and that. And, and, and I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't waste any time. I, I really have about this much patience for most of that stuff too. Jesus said he doesn't know. If Jesus doesn't know, I'm not going to spend one second trying to find out to think that I'm smarter than him and I know when he's coming. Well, Jesus, I know you don't know, but I talked to God and God talked to me and he told me when you're coming. (laughs) What in the deal is that? If you want to be mixed up with a lot of crazy stuff, just watch YouTube. Oh, wait a minute. I'm on there too. Um, (laughs) You know, you got to be careful what you watch, what you're doing. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. It's just crazy. Oh, man. I believe that we are personally near the end of society as we know it. Definitely America. What I shared back with you on September 6th, I, I really believe that is true. I do. I just believe that is true. The America that most of you and I grew up in is forever changed and there's no way going back unless God pours out his spirit and there's a revival unlike we've ever seen before. So with that in mind, I want to share with you this morning four steps to be prepared. Four steps, four things that you and I as Christians ought to be doing. And the first one comes at it as a negative. So number one thing to, to, to steps to be prepared is don't run and hide. Don't run and hide. Now, those people who are preppers and they whatever, they want to get away from people, they were probably antisocial to begin with. That's just their nature. Nice people, good people. But friends, I, I want to tell you what. Don't go buy some land in the Everglades because nobody will go there because they'll get eaten by alligators and you'll feel safe. <laughs> Literally, I mean, if you're, if you're going to live a life and there's nobody around, is that living? I would rather link arms with you and die with you and call that a great life. Amen? Amen. I would like to believe that God has called you and I to a time like this. All through history, he always did. Christians didn't run. When Black Plague came and other people, people were leaving, you know who was rushing to the fire? You know who was rushing to the calamity? You know who was going to Russia to try to provide aid? It was believers, people that had the love of God beating in their heart, and they were compelled to go make a difference. And people who were destitute and without hope, Christians came to bring hope. This life is temporary anyway. You are going to die. I mean, I, I, in my mind, sometimes I envision silly things like these people have spent all this time and energy to prepare to live, and as soon as they get it finished, they die. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they didn't even get, I mean, it's just a funny little inside joke I have running in my head. You know, I hope that doesn't ever happen. You know, that kind of thing. Friends, don't run and hide. If you listen to some of these YouTube prophets, you're going you're, you're gonna to be willing to die over the government telling you you have to wear a mask. I've heard one of these preachers, you know, people say that. Well, I'll die on the steps of this church if they for, they'll have to come in here and I'll... You're going to die over wearing a mask? You're an idiot. <laughs> Amen. There's a lot more serious issues than that. I tell you what, right in the middle of all the chaos, when it's hard to understand what's right and wrong, up and down, left and right, with racial tensions, you and I as believers are called not to run and hide, but to run to it. And to proclaim liberty, to proclaim equity. Each man is made and woman is made in the image of God. Male and female, he created us. And praise God he likes diversity. Just look at flowers of the field, how they're, how they're made. They're beautiful. I mean, God, if we were all one color, we, do you realize how boring that would be? God, because most of you white people, you're ugly. <laughs> okay, those of you who are watching online, 
Um, you you got to know me. If you're just tuning in to see this, you're like, I don't know. Never, never mind. Diversity is great. In fact, I remember on September 6th, I told you this idea that America, the fact that immigrants coming to this country, it's immigrants that really were part of what made America so great. The diversity and the, and the, and the vastness of, of our different ethnic backgrounds and when we come together and we, and we get to learn about each other and we grow together and, and it's, it's really cool. We gotta not run and hide. We need to invest in. Amen? John chapter 17. It, it's a great, Jesus is getting ready to leave this earth. Or no, I'm sorry, not, um, where am I, John 17? Yeah, John 17. Um, that is not the verse I was thinking of. John 17, 14 and 15. Can you see the next verse? <laughs> That is not it. <laughs> now I gotta wonder where it is. Um, oh man, it's it's it has. Oh, it's John ten. Yeah. Let's. You guys don't have it upstairs, so they're gonna take them just a second to get there. They're quick though. John ten, John ten, and I'll find the verse in a second. John 10, eleven. John 11. <laughs> Who give me 12? Who give me 12? Come on, come on. 12. Who give you 13? 13. How many want to guess 14? We <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so, so John chapter 11 is the death of Lazarus. Okay, so, so Lazarus is dead. Jesus is telling his disciples that, hey, he's sick. You know, he's resting, and then they're all going, you know, but, and we should go there. And they're like, well, hey, if he's resting, well, why do we got to go there? He's going he's gonna to wake up again. And what do you mean? This is like odd. So finally, he's got to plainly tell them he was using the metaphor of rest for death. He said, no, Lazarus is dead. Okay? So in John chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Sounds kind of uncouth, doesn't it? Doesn't say he's resting in peace. He's dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Verse 16. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. I love that. You know what's really interesting? Thomas gets a bad break. Because after the resurrection, he said, I'm not going to believe unless I can feel his hands, see his side. Here's Thomas saying, hey, if he's going to head into Bethany right now with all the turmoil and all the unrest, we might as well pack up. Let's just go die with him because he's going he's to kill him right now. Let's go and we're going to die with him. Man, I don't see a doubter in Thomas at all. Man, in Thomas, you see here a commitment, uh, an all-in. Let's not go run and hide. Let's preserve ourselves. Let's take it easy. Thomas is the one who says, let us also go that we may die with him. Let's give our life to a cause that's worthy of it. We believe he's our master. We're going to follow him. Friends, Jesus Christ is our master, and we will follow him. Amen? So the first step in being prepared is let's not run and hide. Let's not run and hide. Larry Norman, uh, you know, kind of like the grandfather of Christian rock and roll, although this song is not very rocky. Um, and understand, this is 1970, okay? I'm going to read a little bit of one of Larry Norman's songs. Larry Norman and, and uh, some of these guys were, they were hard on the church. They were constantly challenging the church. Keith Green, um, these, I mean, these guys... They were not into Christianity as a game and making sure you all look nice and you got a nice church and everything. They were not into it as, are you serving Jesus? 
Are you willing to follow God? In this song in 1970, here's what he says. There are Christians in Russia, they meet underground. In China, they're killed when they're found. And in Cuba, the Christians live up in the hills because it's not safe in the towns. And to think it might happen right here in America, I know you think it's not true, but it's happening to Christians right here in America. Wait till it happens to you. The name of the song is Right in America. Right here in America. And again, he wrote this in 1970. The Christians in Berkeley are passing out Bibles and food to the hungry. They're hoping to help out the people this way. But there are threats of their lives, of their leaders and wives. They're not welcome to stay. And to think it might happen right here in America. Maybe you think it's not true. If you, it's not happening to Christians right here in America, wait till it happens to you. There's an underground church and it's following Jesus and hoping to meet people's needs but we don't have the time to build nice little churches. Besides, we don't need to. We're holding our church in the streets. And we are passing out leaflets and underground pamphlets from Buffalo to Monterey. We're talking about Jesus, and all of a sudden, we're arrested and taken away. So I ask you, America, where do you stand? Your people are starving. They're beaten. They're raped. They're, calling, they're dying in jail cells. So what are your plans? I'm not talking to Congress or you politicians, or Panthers, or Muslims, or Nixon, or Birch. I'm addressing this song to the church. And you call yourselves Christians when really you're not. You're living your life as you please. If you're really a Christian, then put down yourself I'm not talking religion, I'm talking about Jesus. Put all your plans on the shelf. Let's stop marching for peace and start marching for Jesus. And peace will take care of itself. Well, I pray that we Christians will get off our sofas and stand up for what we believe. The time is too short and Christ is returning. We'd better get ready to leave. We who are Christians should turn on the light so the truth will shine bright as the day Jesus will come like a thief in the night and he'll steal all who love him away as in your face amen Christians don't run and hide. First step in being prepared, turn around and face it. Step number two. Four steps to be prepared. Number two, put on the armor of God. Now, I don't mean to use a militaristic type of imagery in warfare. Sometimes we as Christians get too jazzed on that. We're like, yeah! We don't fight battles that we're in like that anymore and the battle that we're in is not a physical one it's a spiritual one it's a spiritual one we want god to be exalted and ourselves to be humbled and die and dead amen and and the when you think about the armor of god it is descriptive in that way in ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 10 finally my brethren be strong in the lord god we could stop right there couldn't we Hey, be strong in the Lord. You want to step and be prepared? Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. No matter what comes in your life, be strong in the Lord. God, we could spend the rest of the morning right here. Be strong in the Lord. 
I remember my dad years ago telling people and challenging them, if you were to exchange your, spirit, your physical strength with your spiritual strength, would you be able to get up and walk out of this room? If you exchanged your physical strength with your spiritual strength, would you have the strength to leave this room? Be strong in the Lord. Walking with Christ. Larry Norman, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about Jesus. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I love it. Sometimes you and I, we go through the calisthenics of spiritually pumping ourselves up. <sighs> we're going to get all ready and we're going to. It's not in your power anyway. Amen? Apart from him, we can do nothing. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. We live in evil days. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This big breast piece here, is basically kind of like who you are. That's Christ, our righteousness. It's not our own. Christ is our righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I love this. Friends, in a time when times are dark, Christians, you and I have the answer. We have hope. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Instead of running away and hiding, we need to run to it by putting on the armor of God, buckling up, making sure that we are ready to share the word of God, to share hope with people. Why does the hope within you always be prepared to give people an answer? The hope is Jesus. I tell you what, and you, and you can do it in, in incredible ways. You really can. You don't have to be apologetic for it. You can be bold and sharing. I was yesterday, like I said, in, in a funeral situation. All these bikers. And the last thing in the world they want to do is hear a preacher. But God was so gracious. I just felt so comfortable there. And I just, I talked to them. I didn't preach at them. I talked to them. And what I expected was, at the beginning, I was praying, oh, Lord, this can be, this can be an unruly crowd, and, you know, as soon as I start talking, they're going to wander off, and they're going to go back to the, you know, back to the drink, and even though, I mean, they were drinking while I was talking. I've never had that happen. Well, I have had that happen before, too. <laughs> Just not here. <laughs> that I'm aware of. But you know, God, when, when you're speaking and you're just talking to people and you're talking about the hope that's within you and how Jesus changed your life and how God loves you, and I said that so many times, God loves you. And you would think in this particular atmosphere that people would have gotten, gotten like, oh, but I don't hear this. Tell you what, you could have heard it. We're outside. You could have heard a pin drop. Nobody left. They came, in fact, they'd drawn in just a couple steps closer because they wanted to hear what I was saying. Friends, shod your feet with the gospel. The gospel of peace, the, the gospel of good news. Put on the armor of God. You want to be prepared? Read this. Get prepared. Get dressed properly. Having girded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having your, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. People are going to be shooting darts at you and there, whatever else. You know something? We just kind of extinguish them. We are not hurt. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Friends, you know the armor of God is all about the offense. You've heard messages like this in the past. That none of the armor is the backside. You know why? Because you didn't run. You're not running from the trouble. We're running to it. And everything, the breastplate, the feet, the helmet, the shield, the sword, it's because we're going this way. Amen? Amen? Number three, third step. The third step to be prepared is be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
You know, if Galatians, before the armor, talked about be strong in the Lord, I would say to you the same thing, but a little, the different emphasis, and that is this, be filled with the Spirit of God. You and I, and all believers everywhere, should hunger for the Holy Spirit. Well, Pastor Mike, what if people aren't Pentecostal? I don't care. They should hunger for the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, tarry ye, wait in Jerusalem until you be clothed with power from on high. That wasn't said to Pentecostals. That was said to the church. So whether you're Catholic, Lutheran, Baptist, Episcopal, e free Christian Missionary Alliance, Whatever it is, we're not afraid of the Holy Spirit. As a believer, you want the Holy Spirit. If you're Catholic, you can say, Holy Spirit, I want all that you have for me. If you're Lutheran, you can say, Holy Spirit, I want all you have for me. If you're Baptist, you can say, Holy Spirit, I want all you have for me. Amen? In fact, if them all are listening right now and where where you're coming from, why would you not do that is a good question. Why would we not be filled with the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You're going to be baptized. You're going to be covered. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love it. Verse 6 and 7, the apostles had the same questions you and I have today. When they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Are, are, are now you going to take control? Is this, is this when you're coming? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, you're never going to know. Verse 8, and he comes back to this, and he reemphasizes it, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You know, I believe the church would demonstrate a whole lot more strength in society if we were filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's that living and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that gives us power. Peter was afraid for his life in the upper room with all the other 120. They're shivering, they're wondering if they're gonna come arrest us. All of a sudden, the baptism, the Holy Spirit's presence comes, fills the place. What does Peter do? Now, all of a sudden, dun, da da da! Okay, maybe it wasn't quite like that. But he has the, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he has the passion that came from God. And he goes up on the rooftop and he preaches to all the people that are out there. He's preaching, hey you, it was you who killed him, the king of glory. And he begins preaching, 3,000 people get saved. He was no longer afraid of his life, he had a spirit of boldness. He had a spirit of power. He had a spirit of conviction. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he wanted to proclaim the word of God. Not knowing if it was going to cost him his life. Because that's why they were hiding. Because they were afraid. And they were waiting. The Holy Spirit comes, and the the Spirit of of power comes. Um, Acts chapter 4. So the church, so from Acts chapter 4, verse 3, they go around preaching. Some miracles are happening, taking place. Chapter 4, Peter and John get arrested for healing somebody, um, for doing a miracle. They laid hands on them, um, and they arrested them because they're talking about and preaching in this, about this, in this guy's name, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees aren't very happy about it. They lock him up, throw him in a, in a jail cell. And then the next day he goes out there and he talks to the, to the, to the court, to Ananias, or Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, John, and Alexandria. He talks to these guys. But Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And he just preaches filled with the Holy Spirit, and he just starts preaching. Verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other name, no other name under heaven, which is given by men, which, which we must be saved. Verse 13, I love this. And they saw the boldness of the people in Maranatha. They perceived that many of them were uneducated, untrained men, and marveled. Oh, wait a minute, you say it about every church, right? 
and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They realized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 18, so they called him, they commanded him not to speak nor teach in the name of Jesus. Peter basically says, hey, we can't help but to talk about the things that we've seen and heard. Is it better to obey you or please God? Get to the very end of that chapter, verse 31. And when they had prayed, I love this because they let him go, and, and they, they go back and they tell all their friends, you're not going to believe what happened, man, we were arrested, man, we were scared, but the Holy Spirit's presence was there, and we just, we just shared the gospel with them. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Great power, the apostles gave witness. With great power. I love that, verse 31. And the place they prayed, when they prayed together, was shaken. I'm just curious. How many of you in here would like to experience something like that? I would. I'm hoping, I'm praying that God's manifest presence. You see, God's presence is here. The Bible says where two or three gather in his name, he is there. He is here. And there are some times when his presence is manifested and, we, and you sense it and you're more aware of it. You're more keenly aware of it. Uh, I, I, can be, I can share you story after story of times when his presence was so thick I could not get up off the floor. I mean, it's hard to describe, but his presence. We started prayer Monday mornings from 7 to 8 o'clock. People come, go. We have some things around the walls to give you some ideas to pray for. There's six different areas that if you want to help and follow through, feel free to come in. Prayer is not, it's not run or orchestrated by anybody. Man, last Monday, it was the kickoff. It was just a great, a great time just to be in here basically praying, saying, God, we, we want your presence. I would love and I look forward to the day when God's manifest presence shows up and scares the hell out of all of us. It's a scary thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. You know when Jonathan Edwards preached that? He preached it like this. He had very poor eyesight and he was just reading it and it's a long sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he's, he was just reading it. Okay, a sermon. People in the chairs, reporters that day, said people were hanging onto the pews out of fear of falling into hell. Some people were screaming in pain. They could feel the pain of fire at their feet. They were crying out and screaming out. And he's just, he's just reading a sermon. And, and all this is happening out there in the pulpit. People hanging on the pillars and the pews for fear of sliding into hell. God, I would love to be in the place where you shake it. I remember being down in Pensacola, Florida in the time of worship was just, just marvelous. It was just so intense. His presence was rich. You've heard me share this story in the past. I used to wear glasses. I've had, since had LASIK, but I used to wear glasses and, and I'm wiping, I'm picking my glasses off and I'm wiping the tears, just saturating his presence. The worship was incredible. And finally, I'd, I'd taken my glasses off and wiped the tears away so many times. I'm like, finally, forget this. What am I thinking? Put them in my pocket and just bawl. And just be in his presence. And I heard a sound. I mean, I literally heard a sound that was like just a whirling in the auditorium. And I opened my eyes and I felt foolish. Like, God, are you really going to look? I'm like, yeah, I'm really going to look. You know how you have these little discussions with yourself? I really thought I was listening to angels hover inside that auditorium. There was this, this, and I opened my eyes hoping to see angels. I didn't. But yet to this day I believe there were angels that were in that place. I would love to be in a place where the Holy Spirit just shakes it. Where we all go, what was that? 
And we get to say, that was the presence of God. You know, I believe if the earth's gonna move, you know what has to move first? Is he has to move in your life. He needs to shake you. The presence of the Holy Spirit needs to shake us. And Monday's a little bit about that Monday morning. Again, I realize most of you, you're off to work, you can't stop in. I'm not, this isn't about guilting you into coming to pray Monday morning. Believe me, it's not in any way, shape, or form. But in your private life, you need to be praying. Because God will never shake the place that you're in, possibly, if you're not a person that has been shaken. If you have not been shaken. What I'm saying is, we have to hunger, we have to want more of him. Amen? Amen? To want him. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then lastly, four steps to being prepared. Don't run and hide. Run, uh, put on the armor. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, run to the trouble. It's kind of the opposite of the first one. The first one is don't run and hide. But literally, I want to say, hey, run to the trouble. When you see a need, go fill it. When you see despair, step in there and bring hope. When you see people who are hurting, you step in and bring healing. In the name of Jesus, Jesus sent out the 70. Guess what? He sent out you and I too. Go ye therefore in all the world and share the gospel. Go. I love that. Go. Go. John chapter 11. When I get there, let's hope it's the right one. Nope. I inverted John. Let's go to John 17. Let's try that one where we were at first. Let's see what surprise awaits us. Let's go to John 17. Um, but now I've got to guess what verse. Um, verse 14, you think? Uh, okay, yep, that's it. Verse 14 and 15. Thank you. You guys are so smart. I'm telling you. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. It's my neighbors are driving me crazy. <laughs> Some of you are aware my parents are my neighbors. <laughs> I wasn't up too late. My parents are driving me crazy. I mean my neighbors. <laughs> Jesus, in John 17, he is praying. He's just getting ready to leave the earth. And in John chapter 17, um, it really is the Lord's Prayer. If you read John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. And he prays great prayer. Um, but, and here's what he does when he prays for you and I. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Friends, you and I are not of this world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I love this. Hey, you, friends, we're not in the world. But he says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. Friends, it's never his intention that we run and go hide somewhere. But rather, you and I, we run to the need. We run to the need. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 11 through 16. I'm sorry, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Wherever we go, chapter 16, verse 13, just turn over, the, just go to the right. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave. Be strong. The marching orders of our master never change. Go. You want to be prepared for what's coming? 
go. Go to it. Don't run and hide. Don't run and hide. Put on the armor of faith. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And let's run to it. Amen? Go ye therefore into all the world. He didn't say, go ye therefore in all the safe places. Go when it's convenient. Go when there's no trouble. Go ye therefore in all the world, preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples of all nations. I mean, that's our commission. That's our mandate. Hallelujah. God is good. May I just remind you too what John said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. He says, friends, the world is passing away. The world is passing away. It's going to be going through birth, poil, trank, uh, tri- uh, birth pangs and trials. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The world's passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Praise God. Father, We seek your face. We ask to be filled with your spirit. May we be spirit-filled people, people with a spirit of boldness, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. What you've given us. Your word says that we have not been given a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of boldness and of a sound mind. Father, I pray that your church would be resurrected your church, people who are called by your name would run to the trouble. And Father, we're quick to give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.